Hello, and welcome to English Worship. Today we'll be taking communion, so please make sure to have the communion elements ready by that time. And now let us worship the Lord our God and sing praises to Him. Joe 
horses to the edge and sail by heavy stone and the sire still and all of them. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forever.
Oh God, how you love me. Yes, you love me. Let's bow our head and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you because you are our God. We praise you because you are holy. We praise you because you love us so much. You know and see everything. You are in control. There is nothing that you cannot do. We know that you will listen to our prayer and answer our prayer when you think the time is right in your ways. We trust you, Lord. We pray that during this pandemic, the time of uncertainty and fear. Help us love, mercy, and have peace in you for ourselves and for others as we face difficult period of time. We pray for those who are sick. May God use your healing hand to heal them. We pray for those who don't have enough food to provide food for them. We pray for your protection in every home. We pray for those who are struggling with loneliness and losing hope. May God comfort them, strengthen them, and give them hope. Lord, help us find joy and peace in you. No matter what the situation is, you are our Savior. You are trustworthy and you are our God. You will never leave us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Dear God, thank you for bringing us all here today to praise you. School, sports, and other activities are starting again, and I pray for protection. Since wearing masks and staying six feet apart does not guarantee that we're safe from the virus. I pray for a smooth transition for those who are choosing to go back to school for hybrid learning. Lord, I pray that you can give the teachers motivation since more preparation will be needed to provide engaging lessons to the students online and those in classes. I also pray for the families who are struggling through unemployment, loss of loved ones, and those with financial issues due to this pandemic. I pray that you can give them strength so that they can overcome these challenges. Lord, I know that getting over these obstacles may not be easy, but as long as we put our faith and trust in you, nothing is impossible. Dear God, in March of 2020, in-person learning has been switched to distance learning. Opening laptops and logging onto classes, doing homework digitally, has been easier to fall behind everything than before. I pray that you can help every student stay on task and keep up with the rest of their classes. I hope everyone who has problems focusing, you can help them focus. Lord, you have, the prob you have the power to do everything. I pray that you can help them. During this lockdown, many people got depression and anxiety. I pray that you can use your powerful grace to save them. This pandemic has really troubled humans' life harshly. It's like a test, a test to see how truthful I am to you. This test has triggered many of us. So I pray you can get everyone to the right path and to follow you. I pray that you can let more people know you more so that they can get into your kingdom and be a Christian. Lord, even though many of us don't enjoy this pandemic and this lockdown, but I still greatly appreciate it. This shelter in place has taught us to be thankful. I never thought being able to breathe like we did in the past has been such a blessing. I never knew that being able to go out the door without being afraid of any danger would be something that I greatly appreciate. But now I know. Everything I have is something that I treasure. Thank you, Lord, for your patience, protection, love, mercy, and everything you give us. Thank you for creating me and guiding me in the right path. Thank you, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that we are able to get together today to worship you. You are our mighty God. Thank you for everything you have provided to us. We love because you first love us. Lord, we put our country into your hand. Through the pandemic, it has brought many challenges to people financially, emotionally, and physically. We are seeing many crimes, violence, and hatred happen in different parts of the country. The shooting we had in Boulder and Atlanta had caused many people to die. We pray for the victims and their family, hoping that you will give them the strength. Through this pandemic, we have learned a lot. 
We may take things for granted. Now we learn that just able to live and spend time with family is a blessing. I do not know when this pandemic will end, but I'm sure that it will end according to your view. You all have your timing and may we all continue to wait with patience and seek for your wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, we have the privilege of celebrating communion. Communion was instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ on the night that he was betrayed. It was his deep desire and command that we remember him, his broken body and his shed blood as a sacrifice for the remission of sins. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 11, starting verse 23, when Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And here there's a word of caution. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. So we come to this time when we remember the Lord according to his command and his wishes. That was the night in which he was about to be betrayed. And we can just imagine, you know, the pain in his heart at the sacrifice that he was about to make, the separation from God the Father, with whom he was together for all eternity past. And amongst the disciples was one who was going to betray him. And Jesus just showed his love and even washed Judas' feet. So when we come to the table, we are warned to examine ourselves. So let's take a moment right now to confess our sins quietly to God and to come clean so that we will not take the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner. Let's bow and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege of coming to your table. We thank you, Lord, that you allow your body to be broken for us and your blood to be shed for us. And we pray, Lord, that as we have confessed our sins, that we come to the table in good standing with you, where there's nothing hidden, where every sin is confessed. And Lord, with genuine repentance, we ask for your forgiveness. And we also want to tell you that we are grateful, that we appreciate the great sacrifice and the great gift that, Lord, you made for us when you gave yourself up on the cross, when you suffered and you bore our sins and you died. We thank you, too, that because you were sinless, the grave could not hold you, but you overcame death and you have victory over the grave and that you rose up again, and now you have ascended into heaven. We thank you for that ever-living hope of the resurrection that we have in Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I should also say that, that this communion is for those who have believed in Jesus Christ. And here at CCIC, we also ask that you Abstain from taking the communion until you have been baptized. So if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and have been baptized, uh, we invite you to go ahead and take the elements with us. If you have not yet received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, 
and have been baptized. We ask that you just observe and do not participate in the communion. For those of you at home who have prepared the elements, let us take you know, of the bread and the cup in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ and his great sacrifice and the great love with which he did all this for us. Let's celebrate communion together. May the Lord bless you as you remember the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only here, but in every moment of our lives, let us live for him because of the great sacrifice which he made for us. And let us live for him out of gratitude and give him our all. There's nothing that we have, nothing that we are that does not belong to him. The Lord bless you. Well, good morning. It's great being with you once again. The word of God does not speak into a vacuum or just empty spaces. You know, Sunday after Sunday, you and I sit before God's word, looking for him to speak a word into our world and into our lives. We do this because we believe God's word is living and active. So let me begin this morning's sermon by telling you a bit about the reality that God's word has been speaking into as I um, prepare for this sermon. As I prepare for this sermon, my heart has been heavy with the recent news. As you know, it seems that violence against Asian and Asian Americans has been on the rise. Now, some of you, as I even speak of this, might think, you know, what, what does this issue have to do with us? Does this really concern us if it doesn't affect us personally? And so why talk about it? We talk about it because we, as a church, are mostly ethnically Chinese. We talk about it because some of your friends and family members live in cities where some of these violences have been. We talk about it because it affects the Asian American community inside and outside of the church. And we talk about it because we are called as God's children to be salt and to be light of this world. And we don't want to lose our saltiness and we don't want to hide under a bowl, so to speak. One study shows that hate crimes against Asian Americans rose 149% in 16 major cities in this past year when compared to 2019. Another organization received reports of over uh, 3,800 incidents of hate against Asian Americans within just this past year. And you've probably seen online videos of verbal assaults, harassments, physical attacks, and vandalism. And the reality is that most of the, um, some of the most vulnerable populations within the Asian American community that are targeted in these incidents are the elderly and the women. Of course, we mourn the the senseless violence in Boulder, Colorado this past week. But we also mourn the loss of lives, precious lives in the shooting of Atlanta two weeks ago, where eight people were murdered and six of the people were Asian American women. Now, but statistics can be impersonal. It becomes more personal as I reflected, as I think about my own parents. You know, I thought, you know, will they be safe when they come and visit? It becomes personal when I think about my own family. Will they 
be in the recipients of harassment if they go out. A lot of Asian Americans inside and outside of the church, Christians and non-Christians, are feeling um, a variety of emotions right now. They're feeling angry, they're feeling sorrowful, they're feeling fearful, and they're feeling hopeless. You know, they're angry at the perpetrators and the racism that is persistent. You know, they're hurt uh, with, the, with the pains and the loss of lives that has happened within the community. And some people, I think, are really truly fearful even as they walk the sidewalks of the streets. And many people feel hopeless because they think that change doesn't seem to come fast enough. So really, my heart has been heavy with this recent news. And I wonder if, if yours, as I'm speaking to you now, is also heavy with the news that surrounds us. But I hope that as you bring your heavy hearts to God, you will know that God understands and ultimately that He is with us. And I hope that this word this morning to us will bring you and renew your hope in the midst of these challenging times. As you know, Easter is next Sunday. But did you know that there's an anticipation toward Easter? And the anticipation begins a whole week before Easter Sunday. It begins with Palm Sunday, which is today, uh, where we remember Jesus' entry, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And then with the coming Thursday, we remember Jesus' washing His disciples' feet, and we remember the Last Supper. And of course, Good Friday, we remember Jesus' sacrifice and His suffering on the cross. And it ends on Easter Sunday, where we remember that Jesus did not stay dead, but He resurrected. So today, as I mentioned earlier, today is Palm Sunday. And so rightfully, our passage this morning will be on the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. So let's read the text together. I invite you to really open your Bibles as we are in Matthew chapter 21. Verse 1 to 11. Let me read that for us this morning. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and He will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a beast of burden. Verse 6, The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when they entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. So let's pray together as we look into God's word and receive God's word together. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks um, this morning that we can gather around your word and learn. We now pray that you would speak through the power of your spirit, through your word, and into our lives. 
may we align ourselves with the psalmist's prayer this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Now the title of this morning's message is A King Beyond Our Expectations. A King Beyond Our Expectations. Now this passage that we've just read is is pretty straightforward. Many of us have read this story throughout our lives and we might remember like a Sunday school lessons where a picture cut out of Jesus and a donkey and, and we see that in a Sunday school lesson. Or you might have, you might remember um, that perhaps you were at a family camp or family retreat and there's sometimes these uh, sessions where you act out Bible scenes, right? You must, so you might have even act out this scene of uh, Jesus in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So is there anything that we can really learn from this story other than just that it happened? Well, I think to truly, truly understand um, this story and ultimately Palm Sunday, I think we must understand that there is a tremendous mismatch, mismatch of expectation and outcome that is in this story. What I mean is that the crowd had an expectation, but that expectation did not match up with the outcome. So this morning, I want to share with you two ways that Jesus was a king that was beyond the crowd's expectations. Two ways. So let's see the first one together. Now, the crowd's first expectation was that the Messiah would be a king who comes in power and authority to restore Israel. And many of us knows this, right? The Jewish people were waiting for the Messiah and they had this expectation of a future savior. This king, this anointed one coming from the line of David would one day come and save God's people. And we see this throughout the Gospels, right? When you read it, you see that people were looking for the Messiah. And now, the Gospel of John gives us another detail of this um, event of the triumphal entry during Palm Sunday. The Gospel of John tells us this clue about another clue about the expectations of the crowd. It, it says that the hap- this happened during the Passover, during the Passover. Now, again, as you know, the Passover is one of the most important festivals in the history of the Jewish people. Um, many, would pe- many people would travel as pilgrims uh, to Jerusalem during their annual feast of Passover. And during Passover, people celebrated and remember what? Remember God's deliverance from the hand of Pharaoh and from slavery from Egypt. And you remember the story in Exodus, right? During the last plague, the Israelites were to, this is important to note, they were to sacrifice a lamb and what marked the door frames of their homes with the lamb's blood. And so when the Lord passed through Egypt at night to bring the judgment upon uh, Egypt, this judgment would pass over the Israelites' home and spare the lives of the Israelites' firstborn. And because of this event, the Israelites were finally released by Pharaoh from slavery and they were eventually formed into a great nation. So you see, Passover was an event that celebrated the liberation and the salvation for the Israelites. And so, as I mentioned earlier, that while there is a general anticipation of people looking for the Messiah everywhere, this anticipation for the Messiah usually rises to a new height, uh, to a new fervor uh, during the Passover. 
And throughout the gospel, you know, as Jesus has performed these healings, these miracles, we see that his fame has begun to spread throughout the whole region. So during this Passover, in our passage, people must have been wondering, could Jesus be the Messiah King that Israel had long hoped for? Could this Passover be the one that God would send his Messiah to save his people? Now, we also should talk about the donkey in this passage. This really interesting detail is actually included in all four accounts of the, of the end triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And it tells us that as Jesus was nearing Jerusalem, he came to a place called Bethridge. And this was a, Bethridge was a small town on the east side of Jerusalem. It's really only a couple of miles. It's like a suburb of Jerusalem, a couple of miles from Jerusalem. Now, we know that Jesus and his disciples has already walked a long way from Jericho all the way to Jerusalem. So was he tired? Is that why he needed this donkey to finish these last couple of miles into Jerusalem? And we know that the answer is no. This act of riding on a donkey was a well-planned out and deliberate action by Jesus. And that's why Matthew quotes um, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 here in, in verse 5 of our passage. Let me read that to you. It says, Say to the daughter of Sion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, mounted on the donkey, on a coat, the foal of a beast of burden. Now, to you and to me, this, this verse from Zechariah might not mean so much. But to the Israelites, this passage means everything. Because it was a clear reference of the Messiah King that was to come. You know, it's like when we, uh, if the Air Force One comes into the airport in San Jose, SJC here, we know that the president is probably here because the Air Force One is here, right? So it's kind of like that. And in choosing to ride into the city on this donkey, Jesus is making clear that he, he indeed is the righteous king of the line of David. And he is indeed the Messiah. So what we learned so far is that Israel was looking for this Messiah. And finally, they see this, uh, this man, uh, Jesus, coming into the city, the king, the city of David, the city of the kings, as the king to fulfill the prophecy, riding on a donkey into the city. So there you can imagine that their, their hope uh, to establish the nation of Israel was, was, was so um, ready. They were so ready for that because as they see this scene. But as Jesus came as a king, he came as a king that was beyond their expectation. Yes, he was the Messiah King. But he also came as a humble and a servant king. And we see this from the passage and, and within the prophecy itself. Jesus, our King, did not ride into the city on a magnificent horse, right? You see that here. Jesus, our King, king came on a lowly animal, a beast of burden. And Matthew specifically says that he came in humility. You know, just the chapter right before this passage, Jesus told his disciples, Whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So you see, all along, Jesus was not going to be the kind of royalty that the crowd expected. Royalty gives order. Royalty rules with power. Royalty expects 
others to serve them. Not so with Jesus. Jesus, our Messiah King, came to serve others. And we see this throughout the gospel. He didn't serve the ones in power or the, or the wealthy, but he came to serve those who are in need of healing and the ones who are outcasted by society. And he came to serve the ones that no one wanted to associate themselves with. Now, so what does this mean to us if Jesus came beyond their expectation as a humble servant king? And I think there's two applications for us. The first one is that as his disciples, Jesus calls us to imitate him, right? If our king is a humble one and chooses to serve others with his life, what makes you and I as his followers? You know, as I, again, thinking about the recent news that has been heavy on my heart, you know, again, I think that some in the Asian American community are really hurting right now. And as I watched one of the, the videos on this past week, uh, my heart broke. As I watched a video of an elderly Asian woman recounting her attack this past, this past week, and as she cried and, and she explained the incidents and this un unprovoked attack on her, she spoke in Cantonese. And I understood every word. She sounded like my, my grandmother. And she was confused and she was hurting emotionally and physically. Brothers and sisters, I think that there is an opportunity here for us to go in humility to serve and love the people who are hurting right now. Maybe it's to ask an elderly neighbor and ask, how are you doing with the recent news? Maybe it's to call your friends or your families and see if they are doing okay. Maybe is to serve them by listening to their stories and listening to the fears that they have right now and bring Christ's presence and light with you as you do that. Jesus went to the vulnerable, the people who are invisible in, our, in, in, their, in His society. Who are these people in our lives? And how will we serve them in humility and share with them the love and comfort of Christ during this time? You know, the second application from this point is that is one curious character that often go unnoticed in this story is the, is the owner of the donkey, right? If you think about it, he really didn't have much to offer. And he might not even know uh, what Jesus was going to use, what he offers. But he was willing to obey. When the Lord asked, he gave what he had. So again, I wonder, if God asks you and I to go and offer the little that we have, Will you and I be like the owner of, this, of the donkey? Or will we hesitate and make excuses and say, you know, God, I, all I have is, is a little donkey. It's, it's not much at all. You, God, you should find someone else. So often we tell ourselves that we don't have anything to offer. But maybe during this time, where our community is hurting, where there is tremendous turmoil in society, God might be asking some of you, like when He did to the owner of the donkey, to offer Him your service, whatever little that you have and give, can give. 
So that's the first expectation that I think we can draw out from this passage is that they expected, the people, the crowd expected a king who would, who would come in power and authority to, to establish Israel one again, once again. But Jesus came as a humble and as a servant king. Now, the second expectation of the people that we can learn from this passage is similar to what we just talked about, but it's also a little different. The second expectation is that the people seem to have expected a king who was also a military conqueror. And we find this in verse 8 of our text. Let's read that together. It says, Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the tree and spread them on the road. Now we see two, two things here in the crowd that did, that, that what the crowd did that tells us about their expectations. The first thing to notice is that they spread their cloaks on the road for Jesus to walk on. Now this was an act to honor a new king. And we find actually find precedence in this in, in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13. It's kind of like the, the modern day concept of the red carpet, right? You know, to honor someone really important, we roll out the carpet for them. It's kind of like, you know, if you've seen the Oscar, uh, where only the important people, the celebrities, are to walk on the red carpet, right? So in this case, the important person that the crowd wanted to welcome in was their Messiah King into the city. So they rode out the red carpet, so to speak, with their own cloaks to welcome them in. And the second thing to notice is that the people, what, took uh, branches from trees and also lay them down on the road. And this is exactly where we get the idea of Palm Sunday is, right? Now, if you've been to a service, sometimes they actually pass out palms and where you can wave during the service. And so the people wave their palm branches and they lay them down on the road for Jesus to walk on. But have you ever thought about why they use palm branches? You know, was it because it was pretty to wave around? Was it because it's a, a fun prop, you know, like for celebration? Or was it that, you know, the disciples and Jesus walked a long way and so they were tired, so people wanted to uh, cool them down and fan them? No. Palms were actually a symbol of Jewish nationalism. It was a symbol for the nation. And you know how in, in, the United, in our United States of America, you've seen this symbol of, um, of a bald eagle on the national seal, right? So it's kind of like that. A uh, palm was the national symbol, uh, symbol of, for the nation of Israel. But more than just a symbol, it was a symbol of victory for them. The palm branches reminded the people of a really important event in their history. And just about 200 years before this time that Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem, Israel was under another pagan empire. But a Jewish priest named Judas Maccabees led a successful revolution and drove out the enemies from Jerusalem and he cleansed the temple of the idols that the pagan, pagans have put in there. And because of this um, Judas, Judas Maccabees' um, victories, it was said that they welcomed him into the city of Jerusalem with what? With palm branches, waving them. 
So what I'm trying to say is that you see this one little verse here is more than meets the eye. Um, what, what the people were doing here is that they welcomed Jesus into the city as a king, and they also probably expected him to become a revolutionary, a military conqueror, who would use his divine power to drive out the Romans, and again to restore the prominence of Israel once again. And that's why we see in this passage, people were so caught up with the event, so excited that they began to shout out, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna literally means save. And son of David is a clear, clear um, um, reference to the Messiah. And so they're shouting as they enter the city, um, save, you know, praise God, finally, our King, our Messiah from the line of David is here to take care of the Romans, is here to save us. You see, again, this was their expectations. But like before, when the crowd expected their Messiah to come in power, and when Je- but Jesus came as a humble king, here also, Instead of coming as a, as a conquering warrior, Jesus came as a king that was beyond their expectation. He came as a suffering and a sacrificial king. When Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem, he knew that his destination was not the royal palace. Instead, he knew that his destination was a lonely hill. He knew that his purpose was not to sit on the throne. Instead, he knew that his purpose was to be hung on a cross. Jesus, the Messiah King, to everyone's surprise, was not going to conquer the Romans. He was not going to be a political leader. He was not going to be a revolutionary. Instead, he was going to die. Jesus knew all along that instead of saving them from the Romans and to bring peace to the nation of Israel, The final goal of him coming into Jerusalem as a king was to save the world from sins and to bring peace much greater than the nation of Israel, is to bring peace between humanity and God. Jesus was a king beyond their expectations. Just like the Passover lamb that was sacrificed in order for the judgment to pass over the house of Israel, the house of the Israelites during the time of Exodus, Jesus was the Passover lamb that was sacrificed in our place for the judgment of sins. And that's why You see in the Gospel of John, when John the Baptist first saw Jesus, he cried out, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus was a king beyond the crowd's expectations. He came as a sacrificial lamb for the sins of the whole world. So what reflection can we take from this, that Jesus came not as a conquering king, but as a sacrificial lamb who saved us from our sins. I want to share with you two reflections. First of all, as I immersed myself in this passage and I reflected on and meditated upon it, I 
find myself becoming more and more aware of the crowd's expectations and feelings. The Jews had been with our king for a really long time. After the exile, one after another, emperors and empires would take over the land. And over and over again, they were under the oppression of a foreign enemy. Can you imagine their anger and their pain and their disappointment and their hope for change? They wanted God to bring a strong, powerful king to save them and to bring justice to their enemies. No wonder that in our passage today, we can see their excitement as they welcome Jesus as their Messiah King. So as I reflected on this point, given again all that is happening of these, within these past two weeks, I felt like God was speaking into my, our reality is that, that, that there's many people who feel angry right now. You know, angry at the, at the racism that is in our country that is so apparent. And there's many people who are upset at the senseless violence that we saw in Atlanta and in, in Boulder. And there's many people who feel pain, pain by the injustices and that are, that are targeted at the vulnerables of our community. And there's many people who feel powerless and fearful. Many people who want justice and hope that justice would come and that real change would come. And so I can see that as, as a result, many people like the Jews here, they want a strong leader, someone to take care of all these issues for them, to bring justice, to bring peace to our society. Perhaps like the Jews at the time of Jesus, like a passage this morning, in a sense, many people are also crying out from their hearts, saying, Hosanna, save us, bring peace, bring justice. So as believers, I wonder, my question to us is, who will we point them to? Who will we point them to when they are crying out, save us? And as I reflected deeper of the, into the passage, I began to wonder, you know, why, why didn't Jesus come to address the Jews' uh, anger, hurt, and disappointments? Why didn't he fulfill the expectation of what a Messiah is supposed to be? I think the reason is that because it only would have brought temporal peace and justice. Yes, perhaps the Romans would be driven out, perhaps Israel would be prosperous again. But in time, injustices, idolatry, and wars will come again. God knows now, the ultimate problem for humanity is sin. Sin is the ultimate source of oppression. Sin is the ultimate, ultimate source of hate. Sin is the ultimate source of injustices. Sin is embedded in the hearts of all people. You know, the funny thing is that the people in the crowd that cried out, Hosanna, and welcome Jesus, would quickly turn away from him and instead cried out, crucify him, just a few days later. Sin is embedded in all of our hearts. But precisely because of this, while my heart has had been incredibly heavy this week, as I reflected on this passage on Palm Sunday, I also began to sense God giving me a renewed sense of hope. I have hope because I know that God loves us and He loves our world. And in love, He sent Jesus, not just as a Jewish Messiah, 
but as a savior of the world. And I have hope because Jesus came and he died to address not just the service problem, but he came to address the source of the problem. And because of his death and resurrection, and because when we people put their faith in him, hearts of stones and hate can be changed. And I found myself as, as Easter gets nearer, my hope gets stronger because it is grounded in the reality that Jesus didn't stay dead. He didn't come to the city of Jerusalem to just die. And He will, He resurrected. And because of that, we know that the Holy, He is still alive and the Holy Spirit is still at work in our world today. And my hope ultimately finally gets even stronger because Jesus will come once again in the future as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So I want to end our time this morning with the passage in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 to 10. It speaks of our King, Jesus, coming again as the sacrificial lamb who conquers sin and death. And pay attention to this. It, the passage tells us that every nation, every tribe, every people, together in unity, they will welcome the King of Kings. And once again, with palm branches, they will give praise and honor and glory to God for salvation. Let's read Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. After this, I look and behold a, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, all tribes, people, and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So on this Palm Sunday, during a tremendous time of turmoil in our world, may you find comfort that our Messiah King, Jesus, did come. And may you remember that He came to turn the world upside down as a humble and a servant and a sacrificial king. And may we and remember the victory that we have that was won by Jesus our King through His death for our sins. And may we look forward to a future when God's kingdom is fully established and where we will finally experience the fullness of God's shalom, His righteousness, and His peace. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength. My song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What arts of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone Who took on flesh Bonus of God in hell Blessed pain This 
gift of love and righteousness soon by the ones he came to save till on the cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Oh, <laughs> 